The concept of the golden age of Saturn symbolizes an age of peace, prosperity, and harmony before the invention of agriculture, war, and civilization, when men were, allegorically speaking, made of gold, before degenerating in subsequent ages into men of silver, bronze, and iron. Over centuries, this motif has appeared in various classical and even some medieval and renaissance texts. The following, therefore, is an attempt to gather these sources together into one place to give us a clearer picture of what the ancients thought about this mythical era. We'll look at accounts from ancient Greek and Roman mythology and poetic theology, and even the accounts of late antique astrologers who looked to the configurations of the stars to get a qualitative understanding of the deepest recesses of time. Our first account of the golden age of Saturn is drawn from Hesiod, who alongside of Homer is one of ancient Greece's most esteemed poets. Known for his seminal work, The Theogony, which provides the earliest genealogical accounts of the Greek gods, Hesiod also penned the influential text, Works and Days. Both Works and Days and The Theogony were composed in dactylic hexameter, a form of poetic meter traditionally associated with ancient Greek epic poetry, and most notably used in Homer's Iliad and Odyssey, or Virgil's Aeneid in Latin. Hesiod's use of this meter in both the Theogony and Works and Days places his works within the epic tradition of Greek literature. It's from this latter work, then, that we derive our earliest and most vivid depictions of the golden age of Saturn, or more appropriately, the titan Kronos, who, admittedly, had not yet been connected with the planet the ancient Greeks called Phinon, meaning the shining or bright one. Throughout the works and days, Hesiod artfully blends myth with moral and practical instructions, offering his divinely inspired insights into the human condition and the cosmic order. His portrayal of the golden age under the reign of Kronos is particularly notable for its profound symbolism, reflecting a time when the human race lived in harmony, free from the burdens of suffering and toil that later, more civilized ages would bring. The following passage not only illuminates some of the beliefs and values of ancient Greek society, but also offers us our earliest vision of a utopian era of peace and prosperity, one projected not into some looming and ill-defined future, but into a distant and mythical past. First of all, the deathless gods who dwell on Olympus made a golden race of mortal men who lived in the time of Kronos, when he was reigning in heaven. And they lived like gods without sorrow of heart, remote and free from toil and grief. Miserable age rested not on them, but with legs and arms never failing, they made merry with feasting beyond the reach of all evils. When they died, it was as though they were overcome with sleep, and they had all good things for the fruitful earth, unforced, bore them fruit abundantly and without stint. They dwelt in ease and peace upon their lands, with many good things, rich in flocks and loved by the blessed gods. But after the earth had covered this generation, they are called pure spirits, dwelling on earth, and are kindly, delivering from harm, and guardians of mortal men, for they roam everywhere over the earth, clothed in mist, and keep watch on judgments and cruel deeds, givers of wealth, for this royal right also they received. Then they, who dwell on Olympus, made a second generation, which was of silver, and less noble by far. It was like the golden race, neither in body, 
nor in spirit. A child was brought up at his good mother's side a hundred years, an utter simpleton, playing childishly in his own home. But when they were full grown, and were come to the full measure of their prime, they lived only a little time, and that in sorrow, because of their foolishness. For they could not keep from sinning, and from wronging one another, nor would they serve the immortals, nor sacrifice on the holy altars of the blessed ones, as it was right for men to do wherever they dwell. Then Zeus, the son of Kronos, was angry, and put them away, because they would not give honor to the blessed gods who live on Olympus. But when the earth had covered this generation also, they are called blessed spirits of the underworld by men, and, though they are of a second order, yet honor attends them also. Zeus, the father, made a third generation of mortal men, a brazen race, sprung from ash trees, and it was in no way equal to the Silver Age, but was terrible and strong. They loved the lamentable works of Ares and deeds of violence. They ate no bread, but were hard of heart like adamant, fearful men. Great was their strength and unconquerable the arms which grew from their shoulders on their strong limbs. Their armor was of bronze, and their houses of bronze, and of bronze were their implements. There was no black iron. These were destroyed by their own hands, and passed to the dank house of chill Hades, and left no name. Terrible though they were, black death seized them, and they left the bright light of the sun. But when earth had covered this generation also, Zeus, the son of Kronos, made yet another, the fourth, upon the fruitful earth, which was nobler and more righteous, a godlike race of hero men who are called demigods, a race before our own throughout the boundless earth. Grim war and dread battle destroyed a part of them, some in the land of Cadmus, at seven-gated Thebes, when they fought for the flocks of Oedipus, and some when it had brought them in ships over the great sea gulf to Troy for rich-haired Helen's sake. There death's end enshrouded a part of them. But to the others, Father Zeus, the son of Kronos, gave a living and an abode apart from men, and made them dwell at the ends of earth and they live untouched by sorrow in the islands of the blessed, along the shore of deep-swirling ocean. Happy heroes for whom the grain-giving earth bears honey-sweet fruit flourishing thrice a year, far from the deathless gods, and Kronos rules over them. For the father of men and gods released him from his bonds, and these last equally have honor and glory. And again, far-seeing Zeus made yet another generation, the fifth, of men who are upon the bounteous earth. Thereafter, would that I were not among the men of the fifth generation, but either had died before or been born afterwards. For now truly is a race of iron, and men never rest from labor and sorrow by day and from perishing by night, and the gods shall lay sore trouble upon them. But notwithstanding, even these shall have some good mingled with their evils, and Zeus will destroy this race of mortal men also when they come to have gray hair on the temples at their birth. The father will not agree with his children, nor the children with their father nor guest with his host, nor comrade with comrade, nor will brother be dear to brother as aforetime. 
Men will dishonor their parents as they grow quickly old, and will carp at them, chiding them with bitter words. Hard-hearted they, not knowing the fear of the gods. They will not repay their aged parents the costs of their nurture, for might shall be their right, and one man will sack another's city. There will be no favor for the man who keeps his oath, or for the just, or for the good, but rather men will praise the evildoer and his violent dealing. Strength will be right, and reverence will cease to be, and the wicked will hurt the worthy man, speaking false words against him, and will swear an oath upon them. Envy, foul-mouthed, delighting in evil, with scowling face, will go along with wretched men, one and all. And then, Idos and Nemesis, with their sweet forms wrapped in white robes, will go from the wide path to earth and forsake mankind to join the company of the deathless gods, and bitter sorrows will be left for mortal men, and there will be no help against evil. In keeping with this lamentable depiction of Saturn's golden age, and humanity's long fall and degradation through successive ages, the seeds first planted by Hesiod found fertile soil in the minds of later poetic and philosophical works, particularly among the Roman poets of the Augustan age writing some eight centuries later. These authors, steeped in the extant Greek poetry of the archaic, classical, and Hellenistic world, expanded and reflected upon this concept in their own writings. They found comfort in contrasting an idealized past, characterized by rustic simplicity and moral integrity, with their own times, which they saw as corrupt and degenerate, full of men of iron, ready to be wiped away to make room for a new age of gold. The narrative of a lost golden era, and the subsequent decline of human virtue and happiness, resonated deeply in classical antiquity's collective consciousness. And in this context, the works of authors like Ovid and Virgil, among others, offered further exploration of this decline, each adding their own voice to the lamentation of humanity's fall from its once exalted state. In Virgil's fourth eclogue, that is, in his pastoral poetry, the foremost poet among Emperor Augustus's artful propagandists gives us a vision of cyclical time, and thereby the promise of a restored golden age looming over the temporal horizon. Now dawns the last age of Cumaean song. Once more the circling centuries beg in. The Virgin reappears, and Saturn reigns. From heaven descends a novel progeny. Now to this child in whom the iron race throughout the whole world shall cease and turn to gold, extend thy aid, Lucina, chaste and kind, for thy Apollo reigns. This glorious age, O Polio, will dignify thy consulate. Then shall great months their wondrous course commence. Under thy rule, what trace may yet remain with us of guilt shall vanish from the earth, leaving it free forever from alarm. He will accept his life as of the gods with whom the heroes mingle. Seen by them, the whole world will he rule, now set at peace by his great father's power. To him shall bring uncultured earth her first small offerings, creeping wild ivy, arums, foxgloves too, smiling acanthus with bright polished leaf. The teeming she-goats without call come home. The flocks by lions shall be scared no more. No more by serpents, and by poison plants. 
over all the land, sweet spicy balsams grow. When thou shalt learn thy father's glorious deeds, the pride of heroes, and what virtue means. Golden the plains will slowly turn, with soft and bearded ears of corn. The blushing grapes shall hang from wild briar boughs. Hard oaks shall drip with sweetest honey. There will linger yet some trace of evil. Tempted men will be to cross the sea in ships, gird towns with walls, and delve deep furrows in the fertile earth. Typhus must come again. Argo once more shall bear the chosen heroes. Wars will rise, and great Achilles go anew to Troy. When from time's course thy manhood thou hast gained, no more shall men in tall ships cross the seas, nor merchandise be carried in the same. All countries, then, all good things shall produce. No harrow need the soil, no hook the vine. The hind shall loose his oxen from the yoke. No more our wool need dying with false hues, for rams in meadows make their fleeces glow with lovely purple melting into gold. The grazing lambs with crimson shall be decked. The fates, harmonious to their spindles, sing, Run on, ye happy ages, in your course. Dear offspring of the gods, the time is come. Start on thy road, thou mighty fruit of Jove. Behold the world that sways her orbed mass. Lands, ocean wide, and the deep heaven above. All things are gladdened by the coming age. May my last span of life, this failing breath, be yet sufficient to recount thy deeds. Written around 40 BC, during a brief period of stability following the Second Triumvirate's Peace of Brundisium, this poem describes the birth of a divine child destined to rule the world and reinaugurate a return to Saturn's golden age. Throughout history, this poem about the end of the Roman Civil War was seen by many as messianic and divinely inspired in its prophesying the birth of a wonder child who would restore a world of harmony and justice for all. In the context of Augustan Rome, the work can be interpreted as propagandistic, aligning with Emperor Augustus's efforts to promote a new era of peace and prosperity under his rule. Virgil, through his portrayal of a savior-like figure, could be seen as contributing to the idealized image of Augustus's reign, emphasizing renewal and divine favor. In the Middle Ages, the fourth eclogue took on a new meaning as Christian theologians like Lactantius and St. Augustine reinterpreted it as foretelling the birth of Jesus Christ. Lactantius, in particular, argued that Virgil, through the verses of the Cumaean Sibyl, foretold Christ's future coming. The belief that Virgil had prophesied Christ's birth persisted throughout the Middle Ages, influencing figures like Dante Alighieri, who envisioned Virgil as both a virtuous pagan prophet and guide out of the inferno and that dark wood in the middle of the journey of his life which led him there. The humanist philosopher-priest and astro-magician Marsilio Ficino, in his De Christiana Religione, chapter 24, on the authority of the Sibyls, was also convinced of Virgil's prophetic powers in this regard. Nevertheless, the concept of a Saturnine Golden Age was further explored by other prominent ancient authors. For instance, the poet Ovid, in the sixth book of his Metamorphoses, offers us this description. In the beginning was the golden age, when men of their own accord, without threat of punishment, without laws, maintained good faith and did what was right. 
never had any pine tree, cut down from its home in the mountain, been launched on ocean's waves to visit foreign lands. Men knew only their own shores. Their cities were not yet surrounded by sheer moats. They had no brass trumpets for alarms, no helmets and no swords. The peoples of the world, untroubled by any fears, enjoyed a leisurely and peaceful existence and had no use for soldiers. The earth itself, without compulsion, untouched by hoe, unfurrowed by any plowshare, produced all things spontaneously, and men were content with foods that grew without cultivation. They gathered berries and wild strawberries, cherries and blackberries, or acorns fallen from Jupiter's spreading oak. It was a season of everlasting spring, when peaceful zephyrs and their warm breath caressed flowers that sprang up without having been planted. In keeping with a similar vision, Pompeius Trogus, as quoted in Justin's History, Book 43, portrays Saturn as a just ruler under whose reign equality and common ownership prevailed, epitomizing the ideal of a propertyless, utopian society. Saturn is said to have been so just that no one under him was a servant, nor did anyone have any private possessions, but all things were held in common and undivided, as if the inheritance of one belonged to all. Macrobius says the same in his most famous work, the Saturnalia, stating that the age of Saturn had been a time when no distinction had existed between freedom and slavery, and that all wealth was held in common. This provided justification for the ritual role reversal, or symbolic inversion, which took place during the Saturnalia festival at Rome from December 17th to the 23rd, when slaves temporarily became masters, and masters became slaves in honor of that gloomy chthonic god of time, wealth, agriculture, and the cycle of life and death. These utopian visions are not so much interesting for their historical merit, though there are certainly some who would like to believe they are, but rather they are interesting for their valuable insights into Greek and Roman values and ideals. Their depictions of a time when men lived harmoniously without laws or punishment, where nature provided abundantly, reflects a yearning for simplicity, peace, and a connection with the natural world. This idealized vision underscores the value placed on good faith, right action, and a world free from conflict and senseless destruction. Similarly, Pompeius Trogus's portrayal of Saturn's reign as a period of equality and communal ownership reveals a Roman admiration for some kind of transcendental justice and harmony. Together, these accounts highlight a Roman nostalgia for a bygone ancestral age, characterized by moral integrity, peaceful coexistence, and a deep respect for the rustic, the simple, and the uncomplicated. An age which was emphatically everything their own, and our own, is not. The city of Rome itself preserved the memory of this golden age when Saturn and Janus ruled jointly, in the fact that the Capitoline Hill, home of the most famous temple to Jupiter Optimus Maximus, had first been called the Mons Saturnius, which also explains why the temple of Ops, that is wealth or abundance, Saturn's wife, continued to stand on the Capitoline Hill, and why the temple of Saturn stood at its foot in the western end of the Forum Romanum. In closing, I wanted to look at Firmicus Maternus's Thema Mundi, which further elaborated 
but not necessarily in an idyllic fashion, an age in which Saturn bore the rulership of the times. The so-called Thema Mundi is a kind of theoretical birth chart of the world, or snapshot of where the planets stood at the beginning of time, attributed to the ancient Egyptian sages Hanubius, Asclepius, Petosiris, and Nechepso. It's from this chart that we derive the ancient system of planetary dignities. In the Thema Mundi, Saturn, the slowest and outermost of all the planets visible to the naked eye, ruled not only Capricorn, but also Aquarius, the two signs opposite to the domiciles of the sun and the moon. Firmicus reports the following about the successive rulership of the times. But from this astrological reckoning, it seems that the Egyptians, and by extension, the astrologers, did not share in the same Edenic past as did the Greeks and Romans. The divine wise men of old invented this birth chart of the universe so that it would be an example for astrologers to follow in the charts of men. Therefore, I would like to explain the rationale of that divine story. With good reason, they located the moon in such a way that she would first be related to Saturn and would give over to him the rulership of time. For in the beginning, the universe was rude and uncultivated. Crude men had just taken the first unfamiliar steps towards enlightenment. This rude and rustic time was allotted to Saturn so that human life in its beginning should seem to harden itself by uncivilized ferocity. After Saturn, Jupiter received the rulership of time, with the idea that the roughness of early times should be left behind and mankind be given a more cultivated mode of life. But in the third place, the moon joined herself to Mars and gave him the rulership of time so that human life entered on the right path and already instructed in civilization might learn arts and skills. After Mars, Venus received control of time. In this period, training in learned speech and training in the individual sciences encouraged the education of mankind. The wise men wished this period to belong to Venus so that men would be protected by a joyful and health-giving divinity. But the final period, they thought, should be given to Mercury, to whom the moon related last. For the human race was now purified of crude habits and had learned skills and sciences. Different institutions and customs arose, and wickedness and evil appeared. At this time, men invented and handed down wicked crimes. For this reason, it was thought that this time should be allotted to Mercury. In this we see how the accounts of the Egyptian sages related by Firmicus differs from previous accounts of a Saturnine Golden Age, primarily in its structured astrological context and emphasis on human evolution through different planetary influences. Unlike the purely mythological or poetic renditions of the Golden Age, Firmicus presents a more systematic and astrologically grounded narrative. He describes how the moon's aspect with different planets symbolizes sequential phases in human development, from the uncultivated, rustic times under Saturn to the more refined and civilized period under Jupiter, and then through stages of martial learning, cultural refinement under Venus, and complicated intellectual advancement under Mercury. Firmicus's account, which intertwines astrology with the stages of human development, reflects a more scientific approach for its time, 
distinct from purely mythological narratives that, as we've seen, were widespread among classical authors. By attributing changes in human civilization to the influence of planetary aspects, he moves away from attributing these changes to the whims of the gods. Instead, he applies a systematic astrological framework, suggesting a universe governed by observable and predictable celestial phenomena. This approach aligns with a kind of rationalism that eschewed utopian thinking, and turned instead towards the natural sciences, emphasizing the search for understanding through observation and interpretation of the natural world. This story told by the Thema Mundi would also be recapitulated during the Middle Ages in such works as The Hermetic Book of the Six Principles of Things, which itself was also considered highly scientific for its time, having no place for the fancies of pagan poets seeking either to remember or herald in a utopian golden age ruled by such a gloomy god as Saturn. In the words of Marsilio Ficino, the golden age ought to be placed entirely in the rewards of the soul rather than those of the body. The poet's trifles, however, are best left to children. Medieval Christian thought, deeply rooted in biblical narratives, had no real need for the myth of Saturn's golden age because it envisioned its own paradise lost and paradise regained. In the past, this was represented by the Edenic paradise described in the opening chapters of Genesis, a time of innocence, harmony, and absence of sorrow or death. For the future, Christians look towards the prophesied golden age in the book of Revelation, a vision of a new divine kingdom marked by eternal peace and triumph over evil. The Christian narrative, while clearly distinct from that of the pagan traditions, shares a thematic continuum that spans from primordial perfection to an anticipated future paradise. This journey, symbolically framed between two trees, the tree of knowledge and the tree of life, from Eden's innocence to the eschatological advent of the kingdom of God, reveals a subtle but profound parallel with the pre-Christian motif of Saturn's age. Both tell of a circular journey, or odyssey, a story of perfection and fall from that perfection, a story of reversion, and potentially, a story of ultimate return to that golden age of perfection that, God willing, is an eternal one. Or perhaps it's an eternally recurring story that you'd rather hear instead, with endless cycles of new worlds and cleansing fires. In either case, this marks the end of our exploration of the golden age of Saturn. If you would like to support more work such as this, please visit patreon.com slash themodernhermeticist. And above all, thank you for watching.